Hey, good evening. It's uh, Wednesday night, and I'm glad that you are here with us for our online Bible study. Thanks for joining us on our website. Thanks for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. It's uh, good, to be, good to be back in the habit of Wednesday nights here at St. Matthew's in this season. Uh, we're right now, it's 6 o'clock, a little after 6, so we're done picking up meals, but you can always come get a meal um, through our pickup line. You can go and reserve a meal for next week at stm-umc.org slash WNL, Wednesday Night Live. You can go there and make sure you have a meal next week or, you know, um, it's, it's a lot of fun. The food's always good. We're looking forward at some point in the hopefully not too far future kind of being able to get back together and have our meals together in person and um, have Bible study together in person. I'm really, really looking forward to that. But uh, we're going to um, have a, we're going to start tonight with a four-week Bible study. You know, last semester we did our book, Eight Life Enriching Practices of United Methodist. What we're going to do, we're, what I want to do these next four weeks leading up to Ash Wednesday, and then we'll have something on Ash Wednesday. I don't exactly know what yet, but we're still thinking through what Ash Wednesday will look like. But starting tonight, for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about something that's important to me and something that I've begun to, begun to realize that I don't do enough of and that I don't think enough about, and I don't really, really equip you as a church family to, to do uh, a lot of, and that's evangelism. Um, you know, I, I, I believe the point of all of this. Uh, John Wesley said, uh, you have one job, and that's to save souls. And, and that, to me, is one of the most important, if not the most important part of my job, is to help folks come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think part of why we get ourselves in trouble in the world, why we get ourselves in trouble across everywhere, is that we put the focus of so much on something other than Jesus. Dr. Nick used to always say in seminary, eventually every problem in our life can be traced back to our walk with Jesus. So that walk with Jesus, especially the initial conversion, is of so much importance. That's our main job, is, is to make sure that folks are in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Because once they know Jesus, once we know Jesus, everything else kind of works itself out from there. So evangelism is so important. And, and what got me thinking about doing a Bible study on evangelism was the fact that every year uh, during uh, the end of the year and beginning of the new year, we have assessments uh, for pastors that our conference has us go through. And we're supposed to grade ourselves and uh, have our people, our SPRC grade us. And one of the questions was on evangelism. And I just, as I was reading through this, I became very con convinced that I've not done a particularly good job of equipping you on how to do evangelism. I, I, I offer an altar call every Sunday. I do an altar call the drive-in service. I mean, I, I, do an art, I believe in an altar call. I believe in folks accepting Jesus and following Jesus. I uh, always do that. But I don't know that I've done a lot of teaching on evangelism, and I don't know that I've done a lot of teaching on how to evangelize. And so um, what I'm going to do the next four weeks during this time together is I'm going to share with you each week something important about evangelism. I'm going to give you a method of evangelism. I'm going to talk about all the ways in our life that we can do evangelism. In fact, I'll go and give you the outline for, for, for this, for the next four weeks. Tonight, we're going to talk about basically why this matters. Um, next week, we're, we're, I'm going to walk you through a simple uh, four-verse uh, method by which you can share the gospel with somebody, the good news of Jesus Christ. The week after that, we're going to talk about Paul and how he did evangelism. And then after that, we're going to talk about a little bit about James and how our, our, the way we live and our, and our works show our evangelism. Um, the gospel, the word gospel, means good news. Uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, evangelism basically is this at its core. It's the understanding that we um, are in need of conversion. We're in need of salvation, that we are sinful. And uh, I want to talk real quick before we get into why, why evangelism is important for us to do as Christians. I want to talk a little bit about the need for evangelism. Um, if you look at Scripture, Scripture is the story from Genesis to Revelation of God's plan to redeem us as humans. It starts off in Genesis 1 and 2 with the story of creation. Humans were created in the image of God. They were good. Then Genesis 3 enters in and sin enters in. And once sin enters in, humanity becomes corrupt. And the rest of Scripture is about God pursuing us through covenant to redeem us. And so we see covenants, all these relational elements that God has with us. 
Moses and David and the prophets, circumcision. Then we get to the New Testament, Jesus and faith and baptism and conversion. And it's all of these are about how God is longing to restore us and redeem us and bring us into right relationship with himself. That has to start with a couple of key understandings. First is the fact that, and we'll really unpack this more in the next next week, but in, we, we are in need of salvation. No man comes to the Father but to the Son. We're in need of redemption. We're in need of conversion. We're in need of getting saved, How, whatever term you want to use. I, I slip back into my country roots a lot and talk about getting saved. But, uh, salvation, conversion, whatever term you use. But we, we, we need to go from dark to light. And I think one of the things that one of the, one of the, the reasons why I don't think that we really think a lot about conversion or salvation or the importance of it is the fact that I don't know how many of us in our life have truly ever seen somebody go from darkness to light. I, and, and I'm very big on evangelism. And I'll tell you a couple reasons why. One is the fact that that's what happened to me. I, I can pinpoint in my life when I felt God change something inside of me. And I emerged from a time of prayer, a different person than I entered into this time of prayer. I, I went into this time of prayer lost, not being in right relationship with God. I was, I was growing and I was learning about God, but I wasn't in a right relationship with him. And then I prayed. And I, I just asked God to help me, to save me, to restore me. And as I prayed, I felt God change something inside of me. And I became a different person. My, I became what Paul talks about, the new creation. I, I, I had different emotions, different views on things, different, my heart was different. I, I, went, I was very hard-hearted and mean before that. And after I, I got saved, I became very soft-hearted, very tender-hearted. Um, God saved me. I can, I can pinpoint when and the time, the moment that I got saved. And I emerged a different person from that time of conversion. And I'll, I'll be very clear. That did, just because this is how my experience happened doesn't mean that my experience is the only experience. I, I, I don't want to typify this and say, oh, gosh, well, you didn't have this happen to you, so you're not a Christian. Well, be very careful. I'm very clear. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that my experience is the only experience. I'm not even saying my experience is the best experience. I'm just saying to tell you that's my, that is my experience. It's what I have experienced and how I experienced God. And I know that God changed me. And I'm a different person now than I was before that time. And I can say as a pastor, I've had a couple times in my ministry when I, when I met with individuals. And they have, made, they have made the decision to follow Jesus. And they've taken it very seriously. And they prayed and they sought God. And I've seen a change in their life. I'm thinking of one person in particular. I saw, y'all, the best way I can explain it, I saw his eyes go from darkness to light. Before he met Jesus, there was a darkness in his eyes. There was a darkness in his countenance. There was a darkness in how he lived and how he acted. And after he made some mistakes and did some stuff, and he made the decision to get his right life with God, when I saw him again, there was a light in his eyes. There, there was a light in his eyes that I had not seen before. I saw God change something inside of him. And that's what conversion, that's what conversion is. Conversion is walking down a path that's, that's, that's filled with, if I go to words, I, I don't, I don't know, I mean, I don't want to act like everybody that's lost is a mass murderer because that's not the case. But I, I, th I think before we know Christ, our life is in many ways motivated by a sense of pride, my life was motivated by a sense of pride and selfishness. I wanted what was best for me. And even my acts of religiosity in that were motivated about making me look good. And when I met Jesus, my life turned around and I became a different person because of what Jesus Christ did in my heart. So I, I think in many ways the greatest sin we struggle with pre-Christ is that of pride and selfishness. 
Likewise, I'd say perhaps the greatest sin we struggle with after meeting Christ is pride and selfishness. At least it is for me. I'm always tempted to walk down that road of, of, of pridefulness. But apart from Christ, my life was headed to destruction. Through my methods, through my, through my actions, through my heart, through everything about me. I was, I was going to, once again, to use country language, I was going to bust hell wide open. I mean, there was nothing in me that desired God, nothing. And I, I believe that I would have lived my life in a way that would have been successful in the eyes of the world. I was a smart kid. I was making good grades. I had the future laid out for me. I think I'd have blown it. I really. I think I. I think I would have blown it through my actions. Um, and I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have amounted to much, to be honest with you. That's what I think would have happened if I hadn't met Jesus. Um, but I was headed in a, a bad place. And both in this life and the life to come. Because I, I believe that our sin separates us from God. I, I believe that the greatest thing that sin does is sin. Se- the greatest harm that sin causes is that sin separates us from God and from other people. And the ultimate separation that sin causes in our life is the eternal separation in hell. So I believe that the sins that I, were, that I was committing, the sinfulness of my heart and my actions, I believe that was sending me on a path that was, that was bound bound for hell. I, I believe that with all that I am. And when, when God humbled me and when Christ saved me, it set my feet from a path of selfishness and pride that was going lead to lead to my destruction both now and eternally to a path of life and, and of, of hope and of joy and of heaven now and eternally. And this is not of my own doing. I didn't save myself. I didn't bow up and become a good person. I didn't, I didn't just will myself to be a different person. No, Christ saved me. I became a different person because of the action of grace within my life. And I'm a different person now than I was before that. And so that's what evangelism is. People are not saved by religion because I was relatively religious. <clears throat> People are not saved by moral action. People are saved by God changing our heart. And when God changes our heart, that changes our actions. Our actions are changed by God's grace applied to our heart. Then everything else about our life is changed because of that. And, and the language that Paul uses, the, word, the language that Jesus uses, uses of being born again, Paul talks of being a new creation. That's exactly what happened to me. I was a new person. I was a new creation. I, had, I just had a newness of life to me because of the action of Christ upon my life. Not because of my willpower or my desires or my stuff, but because of Christ upon me and Christ within me. And daily I seek to commune with Christ through Scripture, through worship, through the sacraments, through, through all of life. I desire to walk with Christ. So... I mean, in my testimony was I was I laid, I laid in my room. I was depressed and angry and upset. And I laid there one night, and I was like, Lord, you got to help me. You got, I can't do this. And I felt something within me change. And, and I became a different person. And this is important because the hope of our world, it's not politics. I'm not saying politics aren't important, but that's not the hope of our world. The hope of our world is not education. Education is incredibly important, and everyone needs an education. The hope of our world is not finances. We need money to live. That's not the hope of our world. The hope of our world is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus redeems. Only Jesus restores. Only Jesus gives us life now and in the life to come. That's my hope for all the world. That's my hope for all of you watching and engaging in this Bible study. If that you know Jesus, that you have made the decision to put your full faith and full hope and full life in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because only in knowing him do we know life. Now, that's not to say after we know him that there's not struggles and problems and pains and temptations. Because, of course, there is. We're humans. We're going to always struggle with these things. So I'm not sitting here telling you that life is perfect after you become a Christian. Far from it. I think in many ways life becomes harder after you become a Christian. Because then you're aware of your sin. Then you're aware of your struggles. Then you're aware of all these things. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not at all saying that life is easier. I'm saying that there's hope. And there's a reason to hope. And that, I, think that's, I think that's why I'm such a proponent of kindness. 
And that's why in a world that's very cold and very hard right now and very mean, well, I'm always a proponent of kindness because I wasn't kind previous to conversion. Previous to get being saved, I wasn't a particular. I, I, I might have faked it, but I wasn't kind. I was pretty mean. I was pretty hateful. And as a Christian, I'm not going to live in the old ways. And my old, my old path was hatefulness and hatred and meanness. So I'm going to, the Holy Spirit's just changed something inside me, and I, I'm not going to live that way. I'm just, I'm just not. Because that was the way I was living before, and it was a path that was going to destroy me. And I, I'm not going to, I might be weak and naive and foolish. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I probably am. I probably am all of those things. But I know that my life of hardness and meanness was life that was going to destroy me. And I would rather have a heart intent on seeking God and be kind and naive than I would be hardened in every sense of the word. I don't want to live that way. And it isn't just that I don't want to live that way. I don't believe my Jesus would let me live that way. So tonight, in the remaining minutes we have, what I want to do is I want to talk about two, for me, key verses that I think are so important in understanding why evangelism matters, what evangelism is about. And the, the first verse is going to come from Revelation. Revelation um, chapter 12. Revelation is such an interesting book. Um, Revelation is a book that lays out this vision that John, the, the revelator, has about the kingdom that is to come and what's happening in this world then. And Revelation is a book of great hope to me because Revelation tells us ultimately that God's in control and that God will make all things right. So I jokingly say when I do revivals, and I say it in sermons here, that um, I'm not worried about the world now or anything happening in it. Because I've, read, I've cheated and I've read the back of the book and I know who wins. So I'm not really worried. Revelation 12, it's an interesting chapter in the book of, in the section of Revelation because it, uh, it gives, a, it's, all, it's, it, it, it's a telling of the story of the war in heaven um, when the devil was cast out. Um, and it's a story of actually the birth of Christ. Revelation 12, 1 through, 1 through 6 tells the story of Jesus' birth in, in a very cosmic sense. And then verse 7 through 12 tell the story of, of, of the devil being cast out of heaven. Um, I'll just read this verse 7 to you. It says, and a, and a war broke out in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So we see... We see that there's this rebellion in heaven by Lucifer, the devil, Satan, and his angels. They rebel against God and Michael and the other angels, and they are defeated and cast down to the earth. Okay, That's very important for you to realize, too, that the devil is not God's equal. The devil is at best Michael's equal or Gabriel's equal. The devil's a created being, a created angel, just like Michael and Gabriel. So don't, don't ever think the devil's all-powerful. Or the devil's God equal, God's equal because he's not. He's not God's equal. He is a created being just like any of the other angels. So don't, don't, don't give the de no. The devil's stronger than us, but don't, don't ever. Nothing is God's equal. God has no equal. The devil is at best the equal of the angels. So he's defeated in heaven, cast out. Verse ten says, "Then I heard a loud voice from heaven proclaiming." Now have come salvation, now have come the salvation and power in the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. Then it says, but they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. I love that part of Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. How is the devil defeated? How is Satan conquered? How is evil defeated in this world? By the blood of the lamb 
and the power of their testimony. That ultimately is what evangelism is. What I've been doing thus far, this, this Bible study, has been evangelism. I've been telling you my story, telling you my testimony. The devil is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the power of their testimony. The most imp- I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you tools in this study for how to witness to somebody on how to share your faith with someone. I'm going to give you a very simple method next week on how to share the gospel. But the most important tool you have in your arsenal, if you will, the most important thing you have in your life for evangelism and helping folks know Jesus is for you to tell your story. You to share your testimony. That is the greatest thing that you can do to help others know Jesus Christ is for you to give your testimony and share your story. The devil is defeated by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. That is how evil is conquered. That's how the devil is beaten. And that is how lives are changed when we tell our story. I think of something Bishop Swanson told us once years ago. He said, when someone questions your calling, that's an opportunity for you to share your story of your call. Don't ever see that as a bad thing. Take that as a good thing, that you can share with somebody your call story, how God called you to ministry. One of the most important things that we can do in our life is be able to share with somebody our testimony to what God has done in our life and what God is doing in our life. So a testimony has two components. First, a testimony is what God has done. So I, I've shared with you, I've shared with you what God has done in my life. I was saved at 17 years old. I was saved not, not, not at the youngest of age, but I was saved pretty young in my life. I, I was a senior in high school. So I was saved pretty early, and God changed me. But that is not the end of my testimony. When God saved me at 17, that was not the end of my story with God, but that is the beginning of my story with God. So my testimony continues. I can tell you about sitting, sit, sitting at, at the rocking chair at the old Gulfside Baptist Assembly when I was a senior in, high, in college and, and feeling called to, to ministry and wanting to run from it. But finally God wore me down and, and, and called me to ministry. I can tell you how before that at Camp Wesley Pines when I was a young, younger child, 16 years old, before I'd even really accepted Christ, that I began to feel something within inside me stir up. Well, I knew there's something inside me that wanted to follow God and tell others about God. And sitting outside with Brother Curtis Lott, outside, outside the cabin, talking about how something within inside me wanted to, wanted to follow God. I can tell you about, about being a youth pastor at Raymond Methodist Church years ago and, and thinking, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not called to this. I can't do it. And seeing the light from, from the window fall down and land upon the font, the baptismal font. And I remembered my baptism. I remember that God had called me. And even though I felt inadequate, like I couldn't do it, I knew God had called me. I can tell you, I, I can tell you recently how, how, how there was something, I had a conversation with, with, with a mentor of mine about something that I felt called that I needed to do, and, and, and I knew I needed to do it, but I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to happen and all this. And I'm like, well, it's something good. I'll put a pin in that and think about it later. But I knew it was something I needed to do for my life and for my ministry. And then an hour later, a friend of mine called and helped me figure, told me he was going to make sure I could do that very thing that I talked of with my mentor earlier. Within a matter of hours, this desire had been expressed within my heart to do something, to, for something that was going to help my ministry. And within a matter of hours, God had made a way for that to happen. It what, couldn't have been just co- couldn't just be coincidence. I've seen God move. In these ways, I've seen God move through my ministry. Not because of me, because I'm not that good. But I've seen God move in the life of people in my ministry. Not because of anything I've done. Because of them. Because of God's Spirit. I've seen God change people. I've seen individuals go from not being a Christian to being a Christian to them being a leader in the church. I've seen lives changed. I've seen families healed. I've seen lives restored. I've seen God move. I've seen God grow churches. Not because of anything that I could do, because I'm not that good. But because of His Spirit. I've seen God open doors that couldn't be opened. And God restore lives that couldn't be restored. And God fix things that couldn't be fixed. 
I've seen God move in amazing ways. And every time in my life, every time, every time, when I've been tempted to doubt or give up or quit, God's opened the door every time, y'all. Every time. I've seen so much of God's faithfulness in my life that I can't doubt it. I can't doubt it. I've seen him work in too many ways for me to doubt anymore. The devil's defeated by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. The most important thing you can do to help somebody meet God, to help somebody know God, is for you to share your story. For you to share what God has done in your life or what God is doing in your life. And that leads to the second verse real quick that I want to talk about. This is from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3, 15. It says, But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. And always be ready to make, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands for you an accounting for the hope that's in you. Uh, I think the, key, the NIV puts it, says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. To me, that means that I think there's two I think there's two avenues for evangelism. One is for us to be able to share our testimony, share our story. And, and by the way, that, that means sharing, sharing your story with God. I, I'm going to give you some scriptural tools next week on how to use the Bible to lead somebody to Christ. But the most important thing you can do is just be able to tell your story to somebody, how God's changed your life, your testimony. That's, that, that's, that's, if you will, that's, a, that's an offensive thing, if you will. If we want to go, at, at the, the devil's defeated by the blood of the lamb, the power of the testimony. That's an offensive tool. We go on, we go on, the, on the march against the devil. That's offensive. But then this is a little bit defensive almost. It's always ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. In other words, if our testimony is us telling someone about what God's done, this one's this. I take this to mean this. You need to live in such a way. You need to live in such a way where folks go, what's wrong with you? Why do you live like that? What, what do you mean you can't go on vacation like you want to because you tithe to your church? What do you mean? Wait, 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 wait why, why are you forgiving them? Wait, why are you not going to the ball game because you're going to church? Why aren't you... Laughing at my jokes that are inappropriate and funny. What's wrong with you? Why do you live like that? We need to live in such a way where folks go, why do you live like that? And then you can say, well, the reason I live like that is because of Jesus. The reason why I have hope is because of Jesus. The reason why... I, 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 I give is because of Jesus. The reason why I serve is because of Jesus. The reason why I, I sacrifice is because of Jesus. The reason, why, the reason why I don't do the things that others do is because of Jesus. We need to live in such a way. Not a, not a, um, this is not a self-righteous living. This is not a, oh, you think you're better than me. No, no, it's not that. But this is a life so full of grace, so full of mercy, so full of kindness, so full of God's love that makes folks say, why are you forgiving me? Why are you treating me with kindness? Why do you, why do you let folks out? In the middle of the, I, 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 why do you let them get out in traffic? Why are you nice to the cashier? Why are you nice to that person who is short with you? Well, the reason why I'm like this is because of Jesus. Always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. So if you in, notice what you do when you do that, you're then circling back to your testimony. 
So our lives should be lived in such a way that we have the opportunity daily to be able to share our testimony with somebody. The devil's defeated by the blood of the lamb and the power of their testimony. Always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. Yeah, that's our greatest tool for evangelism. It's the power of our story devoted to Jesus Christ and then a life that's so radically different that folks don't know what's wrong with us. Yeah, that's what it's about. When we do those things, we can point others to, others to Jesus. So that's my prayer for me and for you. Well, my prayer, first and foremost, is that you know Jesus. And if you've not made the decision to put your full faith in Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, if you've not made the decision to, to trust him completely with your life, to surrender your life completely to his will, then nothing else matters. Tonight, that's the most important thing you can do, is make the decision to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, then nothing, none of the rest of it matters. So I pray first and foremost that you've accepted Jesus as Lord. And then if you have accepted Jesus, I pray that each day you're able to form relationships with individuals, that you can share your story. And then I pray that, I pray that your life is lived in such a way that folks don't know what's, what's, what's the matter with you. And you can tell folks about Jesus. So tomorrow, next week, I'm going to talk to you about um, some simple tools from Scripture, how to do evangelism. I'm going to talk about, about relational evangelism at some point. I'll talk about um, Paul's stories. And I'm going to talk about James and how we can uh, live in such a way that gives glory to God, to make folks want to know about Jesus. So I hope, I hope you enjoyed this. I, I'd love to have any, hear any questions you have about evangelism or ways that you can get better at it or questions you may have. So I, I look forward to spending the next few weeks uh, talking with you about evangelism. Have a great rest of your night. Uh, see you in church Sunday, either out front in the front lawn. I'm looking forward to that or uh, online. Um, so see you Sunday at 9 o'clock or 11 in person or online at 8.30 or 11. Have a great, uh, great night. We'll see you Sunday. Thanks for, thanks for being with us.